this lecture. I uh, uh, hope you're doing all well and hanging in there. Uh, as usual, uh, let me start with a question just to make sure that everybody is sort of online and uh, is able to uh, use the microphone and uh, so that hopefully we can have another interactive lecture. Um, and let me ask the question, uh, you know, given the paper, which is about side channels and the specter attack, which got quite a bit of attention in the last couple of years, uh, is this an attack that you are worried about? Uh, and let me uh, pick on a couple of people. Uh, maybe we'll pick some of the international students who are not in the uh, US. James, what are you thinking? Are you worried about this attack? What, how are you thinking about it? Well, I think it was fairly successfully mitigated in terms of disabling the speculative execution on secure paths. So while it's concerning, perhaps from a performance perspective, in that a lot of the performance in modern processes has been derived from successful speculative execution, it does seem that if people are willing to take that hit, it's possible to um, mitigate it fairly successfully. So I wouldn't say it concerns me as a user nowadays if it's going to result in me losing information. Okay, thanks, James. How about uh, Alexander Root? Um, I guess I would. Kind of a, you're in Germany, correct? If I remember correctly. Uh, no, I'm actually I'm still on campus. Yes, you're still on campus. Ah, yeah. okay, good. Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, I, I guess I, I am a little bit worried about about this attack, um, just because I don't think that people are that willing to take the performance hit. Speculative execution is very, very important for performance, um, and a lot of processors seem to still have a problem with this attack, so I guess that I would be pretty worried about it. Uh, okay, good. Uh, how about uh, Nanette Wu? Sorry, I joined in late and missed the question. Ah, the question was, are you worried about this attack? The Spectre attack that's written uh, that was uh, the topic of the paper. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, when I buy a computer, I expect it to be fine. So if there's something that I know that can't go, can go wrong, then like, obviously it's a little concerning. <laughs> okay, that's a good, clear answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. And as we go through, we probably get a better view about like how worried should we be about this stack or, or not. And maybe we'll come back to it at the, at the end of the lecture. And of course, this is a you know, partially a, per, uh, a personal opinion. Uh, but uh, let's uh, so first talk a little bit about like what is a side channel. Um, and so a side channel is basically an indirect uh, communication channel over which an attacker uh, learns uh, a secret. And so, so the picture typically, you know, a picture that you might have is we have an attacker here, uh, we have a server somewhere else, uh, the server is operating maybe on, you know, some piece of secret data, a key, um, and as it's operating or computing on this uh, secret data, maybe the computer uh, uh, sends off some signals. Uh, so, for example, maybe there is some uh, electric uh, magnetic waves that you know come out, or maybe you know the power that it draws uh, you know, changes as it is computing, uh, or maybe the computation uh, changes in terms of time, uh, depending on <clears throat> uh, what you know the values of k are, and so the attacker doesn't really have direct access to uh, the key K, uh, but what the attacker can observe is these signals that are uh, happening as a side effect, you know, of this computation on particular K. And the worry is that, you know, the attacker can measure, you know, these, uh, these uh, side channels and maybe learn something that actually will allow it to deduce, you know, what actually K is. And so from a security perspective, this is sort of worrisome, right? Because we, the key K is sort of completely isolated, but because of these indirect side channels, uh, the attacker might be able to learn uh, this key K. And typically, and you know, you can see this is a bit of a, uh, an indirect attack. And a lot of time in, in computer system security, people have treated you know, side channels sort of more or less as sort of a niche issue, not like one of the primary attacks to be concerned about. Uh, but this paper that we used to sign for today, Spectre, uh, that appeared in 2018, uh, brought, uh, uh, brought these side channel attacks, in particular timing uh, attacks, uh, back to the foreground. And so uh, we're going to spend a lecture, you know, talking uh, about side channels. So to give a little bit of uh, 
you know, history or context here, uh, you know, side channel attacks are a well-known uh, type of attack in the security community. And probably the most famous uh, attack or well-known uh, was this class of, uh, or, or class of side channels that led to the Tempest um, standard. And so I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, so there was in the World War II, so we're going back quite a bit. Uh, uh, there was a, basically in the crypto center, several crypto centers that are used to communicate uh, secret information or confidential information. And they had a machine uh, inside of these crypto centers, uh, and, and basically a, 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 a tape writer um, that, you know, produced a tape um, and that, that can be used to uh, send away uh, uh, with uh, confidential information. Um, and this uh, tape writer was produced by you know, at and and somebody at Bell Labs actually noted that whenever the move, the head moves of this tape writer, the, uh, an, uh, an electromagnetic signal uh, would uh, show up and it actually show up on this oscilloscope. And after doing some internal experiments, he was able to uh, basically reproduce some of the plain text. And so he went back to uh, this at and uh, his bosses, and said, like, well, we may have a problem with this machine. And so at and went to the crypto center saying, like, well, there might be potentially an issue here. Uh, the people in the crypto center said, ah, you know, we're in, we're in war, you know, we can't really worry about this, and how, how could it really work? Um, uh, we're not convinced. And so what at and did, actually, they uh, ran the room on the other side of the street, you know, about 80 feet away, you know, put an oscilloscope there and measured, you know, and did a couple days of experiments or a couple hours of experiments where they uh, recorded the, uh, the, 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 the waves and basically were able to reduce 70%, 75% of the plain text. And, you know, this, uh, this got the, uh, the intelligence community's attention. And uh, in fact, you know, they started developing all kinds of uh, isolation uh, mechanisms, you know, uh, shielding cables and shielding mechanisms to actually stop this electric magnetic waves to, uh, from outside of the crypto centers. And you know, this is a famous uh, story. Uh, it came out of a document that was classified or declassified uh, a, a couple of decades ago. And it's probably one of the mo most well-known examples uh, of a side channel. In computer security or computer system security, uh, probably the most well-known early example of uh, a side channel uh, was the in the 10x operating system, which you know was built around 1970. And I'm going to give you this example because it's an example of a timing channel, and not actually unlike uh, in, in spirit uh, to uh, the one that actually is described in the paper. Uh, and the setting is as follows. Uh, there's basically an application running <coughs> on an, an 10x computer. And the 10x computer has, or this is like maybe the kernel, or this, yeah, think about this as the kernel. Uh, and it has uh, a function inside of it uh, that basically does a password check. And it takes a password as input from user space and, uh, uh, and then checks the password and returns true or false, you know, depending whether the password is correct or not. Um, and it has, uh, and the machine was set as follows. And the application itself was a, uh, use, uh, use virtual memory, so it was actually divided you know, in cages, as you well know from uh, other virtual memory designs. And so the address space was divided up in four kilobyte pages. And uh, to save memory, you know, some of these pages could actually be swapped out you know, to, the, to disk. And so basically the attack you know, goes as follows. Uh, what the adversary does, uh, he puts the first byte uh, of the password in the last byte of a page, so basically, you know, put it like right there, the first, uh, right, and then the rest of the password is then on the second page right afterward. And the attacker unmaps or arranges basically that that second page is removed, you know, from memory, either by unmapping explicitly, if you will, or maybe you're uh, running the machine lower memory so that actually the operation swaps the, that page out. And now, um, and so now the attacker uh, goes as follows. He just basically tries the first character, like an A, uh, you know, calls uh, the password check function, uh, starting with the address with A, um, 
the password function you know, goes check and see if A is indeed the first character of the recorded password. Uh, if it is not, uh, it will return uh, quickly. Uh, if, it is, uh, if it is, however, then of course the password fun function will move on to the second uh, byte of the password. But the second byte of the password you now lies on uh, a page uh, that's unmapped. And so it will take a long time before uh, an answer comes back. You know, the answer may be still true or false, uh, but it will take a long time. And so what, what can the attacker conclude from this? Well, the attacker can conclude that if it takes a long time, that it must have been the case that his first guess, you know, the guess for the first byte was correct. So that the first guess, so the first guess must have been A in this particular example. So what does that mean? Well, so that means that basically to guess the first byte, you know, it takes 256 tries, correct? Because there, uh, a byte is 256 values. Uh, and we see that number 256 you know, showing up in the, uh, in the Spectre paper all over the place too. Uh, so there's 256 tries for the first byte. Once he's got after 256 tries, you will have, uh, you will know what the first byte is. And then you can move on to the second byte and play exactly the same trick. Basically put the second byte at the last byte of the page and put the third uh, byte of the password on the next uh, unmapped page and then go on. And so basically this means that in 256 tries times n, where n is the number of the characters of the password, the attacker uh, will guess uh, the uh, password correctly. Uh, by basically exploiting this timing channel uh, where the remaining uh, bytes are actually on an unmapped page. And let me stop here for a second and just ask if there's any questions about this because this is sort of a, a key strategy that we'll see actually in the Spectre attack too. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Why, were the, why would the different bytes be on the different pages? Uh, the attacker ranges to for the the bytes to be on different pages when it calls when he calls the password check function. How how can the attacker attacker do that? Uh, well, the page the address space is divided in uh, uh, in four kilobyte pages. This is well known, and this is a constant in the VM system. And the attacker can basically allocate an array right for the password. And you know maybe put some bytes before it or by, uh, bytes before it, so that basically the array starts at you know 4,095, uh, so that the uh, you know the first byte is on the last uh, byte of a page, and then the next you know uh, part of the array will be on the next page. I see. Yeah. So basically, the attacker has to do some alignment and uh, allocate memory or allocate some other data structures in front of the password, so that actually the page. The password just overflows the page. Chris, so the attack model means that uh, the attacker has to have direct access to the computer that he's trying to hack. Yeah, in this particular case, this is a time sharing system, uh, so there are multiple users, you know, time sharing the same uh, machine, and so there's no compromise really. Uh, and uh, one user basically is trying to guess passwords for other users. Uh, we'll see in the, in the Spectre case, we'll come back at that. But in this case, it's just a time sharing machine. This is where the days were, you know, whole, you know, for example, where a whole department would use a single computer. Any other questions? Okay, so let's, you know, talk a little bit about side channels. Um, in just before you know 2018 uh, when this paper appeared uh, and basically you know and you've seen this in the most of the many of the papers that we've read so far is that the side channels were really basically not an element of the threat model uh, by and large, you know, with some exceptions, which we'll talk a little bit about, most people, uh, most designers, uh, basically uh, consider the, this kind of attacks, these uh, timing attacks, just basically not part of the threat model. On the assumption that they are so hard to pull off for the attacker, uh, that uh, there's not something to really to worry about. And then, for example, you see this in many, many different settings, but like it came very clearly up in the SSL paper, the secure socket layer or the TLS paper, where in principle, the length of the ciphertext 
uh, leaks all kinds of information because you know, in SSL, the length of the ciphertext is basically proportional to the plain text. And you know, so if you sort of roughly know what's being sent over the channel, you might kind of deduce all kinds of information about the uh, uh, ciphertext or the encrypted confidential information uh, just based on the uh, length of the ciphertext observed. And you know, as you know, discussed in that paper, basically, you know, we consider that a sort of acceptable, uh, uh, an acceptable uh, risk. And so, in generally, uh, in many of the papers that we've read, you know, the, basically, the, under the assumptions that there are no cyber channels, you know, the following scheme is secure. Uh, the main exception uh, where people were worried a lot about uh, side channels uh, and timing attacks is basically crypto implementations. Uh, in particular, you know, you want your signing and verification uh, uh, implementation to basically be independent of the key uh, that's being decrypted or uh, signed or verified with. Uh, you shouldn't be able to leak, no, uh, no bits out of the private key should be leaked, you know, because of actually the way, you know, the crypto is implemented. Uh, so you want to make sure that basically for any sort of sequence of uh, any value of the key, uh, the signing and the uh, encryption just takes deterministically always the same time uh, so that no information is leaked about the key itself. And so this is an area where people did worry uh, quite a bit about uh, timing side channels. But by and large, in most computer systems, people didn't until basically you know, the Spectre paper came about um, and uh, showed that, you know, sort of one of our standard assumptions uh, had some issues. In particular, uh, in particular, the the issue is that you know, basically Spectre breaks isolation. And so, if you sort of think back at the beginning uh, of uh, six eight five eight. Um, the you know the, the, the typical picture uh, that I drew many times on the on the blackboard uh, when we were still you know, in the lecture hall was you know, we have some application had a box around it uh, maybe you know we had a kernel uh, below it uh, you know running on some you know whatever CPU and <clears throat> the storyline was that basically the kernel and the application were well separated from each other. In the sense that you know the application was not able to read the kernel's memory, uh, you know, run in its own, for example, address space, you know, use the virtual memory uh, mechanisms that the CPUs, modern CPUs, provide to basically isolate the application completely from uh, the kernel, and in a way that was basically impossible for the application to even refer, you know, to kernel memory, and so it couldn't read any of the content of uh, the kernel's memory. So, for example, if the kernel that maybe some secret, you know, bytes uh, in the virtual memory system uh, is supposed to guarantee that basically the application cannot uh, get a hold of those uh, secret bytes that might be sitting in the kernel's address space. And basically, what Spectre showed, and what the main uh, part of the paper is, is that you know through a timing channel, uh, the attacker actually can read kernel memory. And then we'll talk about it in detail, but the basic idea is that the, the CPU, uh, the modern CPUs are so advanced, they do all kinds of clever stuff, and they leave traces of, uh, of their computations outside of the, directly at the main processor, for example, in shared caches. And so as the kernel, for example, uh, computes maybe over the secret S, uh, it, it may leave some information or indirect information in uh, a cache line in one of the caches, then later when the application run and the application measures uh, access time to the cache, it might be able to do you know, information. And in fact, in, as we'll see in this particular case, we'll actually we'll find an attack that will allow the, uh, the attacker or the application to, to basically deduce what the values uh, of the secret bytes are. And as you, you know, if you think a little bit of a take a step back, uh, this is sort of bad news, right? Because this means if we have multiple applications or have an application running on the third kernel, the isolation that we're sort of we're counting on, the, the, the box, uh, the, the barrier, you know, between trusted and untrusted code, is not really fully, uh, uh, is not really hard, at least with respect to confidentiality, right? 
one thing to realize is that with side channel checks, this primarily focused on confidentiality, namely trying to uh, reconstruct uh, data, secret data through these indirect channels. So it's not really an issue about denial of servers or, you know, or integrity, but it's really a confidentiality and attack on kind of confidentiality. And so uh, this caused a quite a bit of uh, 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 attention, or this paper drew a, a lot of attention uh, in a sort of wake-up call, I think, for you know, process architect or ar computer architecture designers, uh, processor designers, uh, operating system developers, and, uh, and a lot of things happened, which we'll talk about uh, also a little bit in later in the end of the lecture, to basically try to mitigate uh, these, uh, the, the, this, this kind of attack. Um, and, uh, you know, and today, uh, uh, you know, Operating systems, kernels, uh, processors, compilers uh, are, are quite a bit uh, have been influenced uh, uh, by the, this uh, Spectre attack. Okay, so the Spectre attack, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is partially can happen because you know, the processor got very, very advanced. And there are two aspects of processors that are going to be important or that are central to basically making this attack work. One is caches, shared caches. Um, and second is speculative execution. And these two uh, combined uh, basically form uh, the key ingredients uh, that allows uh, a, a specter attack to be successful. So I'm gonna, let me sp explain speculative execution a little bit better uh, because it's gonna play a central role uh, in the story. Um, and so let's take a very simple uh, code fragment, like an if statement that you know, looks if an offset is smaller than size. And then, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, do some computation. Um, and so, you know, for example, this is a fragment of code where offset is an index into a C array, size is the maximum size of the array, and we're just checking first if the offset is smaller than the size, and if it actually is and within bounds, then you know, we may want to execute some code and operate on that particular array. And so the issue uh, over the, the, the advantage of the thing that uh, brings us, that makes uh, uh, that uh, speculative execution does is that if, for example, size is not in the cache, uh, so it's like it's a miss, then in principle, uh, the processor would have to wait until the value of size comes back from the cache before it actually can execute the next instruction. And, but what speculative execution does, it actually does not wait until the size comes back. It is to start guessing. It you know, guesses whether to take the left side of the branch or the right side of the branch. And uh, let's say in this case, it takes the right side of the branch and it will just start executing these instructions even though it doesn't know what the value of size is. And in fact, you know, with today's processors, uh, and because the, the cost of a miss is so high, or it takes so much time, it is the case that basically a processor might execute hundreds of cycles, you know, speculatively, without actually knowing yet what the value of size, is, what the actual value of size is. Um, and then the idea is that on, uh, at some point, you know, this value size is going to come back from the cache system, and then you know the processor can decide whether it actually uh, misspeculated or speculated correctly. If it speculated correctly, things are all good, right? We uh, executed hundreds of cycles and you know, got a huge performance win because of speculation. If it's a misspeculation, if it's a misprediction, then uh, what the processor does, or what the modern processor does, it basically goes back to the restores the CPU state to exactly, you know, at, at exactly as the same as the CPU state at the point that the if statement uh, was executed. And so basically it does, undoes, if you will, it just squashes all the effects of the speculative executed instructions uh, and basically undo, undoes, their, uh, undoes their work. And but you have to be a little bit careful over here because what it actually restores is CPU state. 
So it will restore, you know, the registers like R0, R1, you know, or whatever, x86, you know, AX, BX, CX, and all sort of the architectural states that's visible in the instruction set architecture is basically re rolled back to, uh, to the same state as it was, you know, before uh, mis uh, predicting. But the processor can't really, will leave some, or the processor can't really roll back all state because you know, some state is exactly outside of the uh, processor. So for example, caches are typically, you know, like certainly last level caches, like L3 caches are often outside of the processor directly and cannot really be rolled back uh, by uh, the misprediction uh, machinery. And so little traces of uh, state are basically left behind uh, and these are what is called microarchitectural uh, uh, state. Uh, that's a state that actually is not part of the instruction set architecture. Uh, it's state that is being used to basically make the process run faster. And, uh, you know, that leaves a little bit of state uh, hanging around. And in principle, uh, there's nothing really wrong with it. Uh, I mean, basically the process behaves correctly, you know, behaves more according to spec, you know, it's really fast, uh, behaves, does the computation correctly, but, uh, it, it can be a problem for security. And I think this, the Spectre paper really showed that, that these, these, micro, these micro architectural site channels or the micro architectural state, you know, like caches can cause uh, uh, information leaks or can be used to uh, cause information leaks. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Okay, uh, so uh, what I'm gonna do is like sort of work out the attack, you know, in, in more detail uh, as we, uh, uh, in more detail. And I'll start out with an outline, then uh, a little bit more, they'll provide close something that looks almost like a real attack and then maybe I'll describe sort of a proof of concept attack uh, in multiple stages. And, and the reason to do this in sort of multiple stages is because the attack is actually quite uh, complicated. Um, and it turns out there's sort of different versions of the attack. Uh, and uh, I'm going to focus on the first version, which is often called Spectre V1. Uh, and this has to do with uh, a, a bound check bypass, uh, in similar uh, sort of in the, uh, in the style that uh, the code fragment that I just showed for before. Um, and so to make clear how the attack work, I just will assume for a second, uh, that there's a piece of code in the kernel that has the sort of following shape. Uh, so there's a character array uh, which has a secret in it. Let's say it's 10 bytes. I'm just making this up. Uh, and then there's somewhere in the kernel a code fragment of the following uh, flavor, you know, very similar to the code fragment that we saw. There's an offset size. And um, in there is an array one, uh, which uses, which is indexed by offset, and uh, that returns a value. And then um, there's an array two uh, that's indexed by V, and you know that returns whatever value that's actually at that particular point. And in fact, it turns out we don't really care about that value at all. And this is about you know all the things that we uh, the, the code fragment that we need to basically uh, launch a successful uh, uh, Spectre attack. So a couple of things that we're going to uh, need to assume. Uh, first of all, we're going to assume that the size is not in cache. And second thing what we're going to try to do is the attacker is going to uh, train the branch predictor to uh, guess that basically if size is not uh, available yet to actually take the branch independent of the value of offset. Another thing we're going to assume is that the attacker controls offset. And so, for example, think about this as an argument to a system call. And so the, argument, the attacker gets to uh, choose offset. The attacker trains the branch predictor. And what's going to happen basically is we're going to pick uh, a large value of our offset or some offset value that basically array one plus offset 
points where it's the same as the location of you know, our secret. Um, and so what this will do, so this statement uh, will read basically then the first byte of our secret into the value V. And then the second thing that we're gonna take advantage then for them is that that byte is gonna be used, that value, that secret you know, byte value is gonna be used to index into this array two. And we're gonna further assume that the attacker uh, can measure uh, how long it takes to read from array two. So think about this, that this is maybe some data structure, an array that was passed from user space through the kernel and uh, the kernel just happens to uh, use V or some function of V to look into this array, uh, not revealing you know, the secret really, uh, but just like reading into this array too. Um, and so uh, the, now the attack is basically gonna go as follows, uh, because there's a miss on the size, the processor will effectively execute. Uh, it will take this large offset uh, and basically read the first byte of the, the secret, uh, the, the first byte of the secret, um, index that into array two, and we're gonna assume that basically array one is in the cache, and so uh, present. And we're gonna further assume that you know, the attacker uh, uncached array two, and we'll see in a second how they can do it, but let's assume that array two is completely uncached. So now the kernel is gonna basically use the value phi index into this uncached ar array and, uh, and uh, will cause basically to uh, bring in the V you know, element of this array two into the cache. Now at some point then size you know, might actually come back from the cache system and the uh, CPU will squash basically all the uh, misspeculated state and restore everything to its original value, except the cache will still contain uh, this array 2v value. So now, what can the attacker do? Well, the attacker can measure, you know, the, um, at some point, you know, the control comes back to the application that's running on top of this kernel, and the attacker can basically measure, you know, array 2 zero. And uh, if you know, that takes a long time, uh, that access, the attacker knows, well, it must be the case uh, that the kernel did not load uh, that value because otherwise it wouldn't be fast. And so basically the attacker can now go through all you know, 256 values of this four secret byte and check them one by one. So array two, one, array two, two, et cetera, et cetera, you, know, you get the idea. And at some point, you know, it will get a cache hit and uh, the cost for actually in that particular array element will be extremely low, much lower than all the misses. And that, if that happens, so let's for example say that is this one, then we know that basically V must have been two and so that the first secret, the first byte of the secret must have been two. And so now, the attacker can move on and start guessing the second byte, you know, more or less sort of similar to uh, what we saw in the 10x uh, case. So this is the basic outline uh, of the attack. Uh, and let me stop here for a second and see if there's any questions. I'm gonna work it out in more detail, uh, but this is the basic idea. Any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how is array two tied to the character secret again? Uh, the, uh, okay, so the array, let me, uh, the array two, correct, here, uh, is only indexed by the secret. Uh, and so we're just looking for a piece of code that basically uh, indexes, you know, with some value. And uh, that's all what happens. And because of the indexing with the secret into that array two, an element of the array two element will get loaded into the cache. And that is what the attacker measures. So he doesn't see V, but he just sees that, that actually the V entry has been accessed by you know, this piece of code. 
and and he uses the fact that that is that it takes longer to execute that that first entry is part of the password yeah or for the secret yes there could be all the entries that have not been accessed will be not in cache and so they will take a long time to uh, access if the attacker accesses the, 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 all the elements of the array two and there's going to be one that's going to be incredibly fast and that's the one that must have been used to actually uh, that has been indexed using the value v um you might be going over this but how does the attacker differentiate between the actual secret v and just like another value close in memory to v that would be like that would share a cache line ah good so uh, very good question so let me uh uh, can you hold this question and let me write down uh, uh, some challenges? Uh, because actually pull, pulling this off is actually hard. Uh, even though, you know, the outline of the attack is maybe not, you know, that complicated, it's actually pulling it, off, uh, uh, pulling it off is actually difficult. And one is cache lines or caches in general. Uh, basically, it requires the attack needs to arrange that every element of this array two is in a different cache line. Uh, if they're in the same cache line, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, or maybe you would be able to narrow it down and saying, well, it's only one of those four values, not one of the 256. Uh, but you know, it'd be nicer actually if uh, array twos are set up in a way that basically every value of, uh, would, uh, ma uh, uh, would uh, map to a different cache line. So that's certainly uh, a challenge. Similarly, um, you know, the, the attacker has to train the branch predictor so that, this requires you know, understanding like of how the branch predictor actually works. Uh, the, the attacker has a bunch of other challenges. Uh, the attacker has to arrange that you know, size is evicted. Uh, the attacker has to evict array two to make this happen. Um, the attacker must be able to read array two Um, the attacker needs to find the gadget. So typically these, these code sequences that are used by the attacker that have to have a particular shape uh, for an attack to work are called the gadgets. So we have the attacker has to find one of those gadgets in the kernel. And finally, the, presumably the attacker needs to deal with noise. Uh, you know, the kernel is probably running multiple applications. Uh, network packets might uh, come in and cause interrupts. And so basically the environment is not particularly stable. And so the measurements might not be 100% reliable. And so the attacker has to count for the fact that, you know, uh, the measurements are sometimes going to be incorrect. And typically, you know, when we talk about these side channels, uh, they're often uh, quantified in terms of how many bits per second they can leak. Uh, and the idea being that, you know, a high throughput side channel you know, leaks a lot of information, uh, and, but often side channels are low, uh, low in terms of their bandwidth because, you know, the attacker actually, actually has to do a whole bunch of measurements, you know, to be basically do one bit or one byte. And so it will take a while to actually, you know, reconstruct uh, from measurements what the actual original input is. Although, as we see in a second, this particular specter attack actually is a reasonable high uh, throughput uh, uh, channel. Okay, so basically the attacker has to deal with all these uh, issues um, and uh, we're going to talk, talk about them in more detail. Uh, and so in particular, uh, we're, the way I'm going to go about it is I'm going to look at Appendix A. Uh, Appendix A basically has uh, more detail on actually how to pull off this, this set of measurements. It's not a real attack, uh, but you know, flushes it out some of the details of actually how a real attack might uh, be able to work. Um, and in particular, uh, in Appendix A, we have the following setup. Uh, and it's important before we look at the code, you know, we actually understand that setup. Uh, there's basically one address space or one virtual memory address space, and the victim code and the attack code are in the same address space. 
And so they share one single address space. So in principle, uh, given the fact that they're in the same address space, the uh, attack code could just read and there's a secret S in the victim part of the address space. In principle, since they're in the same address space, they share the address space, the attacker could just read S out of memory. Uh, but you know, what the Appendix A does, instead of reading S directly out of memory, it actually uses this timing analysis uh, to uh, figure out what the content of S is. So it's not real in the sense that you know, the victim and the attacker are not in separate address spaces or the attacker is like the kernel, or the, uh, the victim is the kernel and the attacker is some user level program. Uh, but mostly for illustrative purposes, uh, the, the, they're in the same address space. And we can still learn quite a bit from actually studying this code to actually understand uh, you know, how tricky it actually is to uh, pull off this uh, attack. So I'm gonna share basically the code uh, from uh, the appendix with you by switching uh, screens. So let me see if I can make this work. Uh, so I have to stop screen sharing of this thing. And I'm gonna screen share. Let's see what happens. Hmm. Okay, oh, that's my. Uh, hold on a sec while I work out the issues here. Is that paper? Uh, actually, can, uh, can do you actually see the code? Because I can't see my own screen here now. Yeah, so we see your screen with the two terminals, one on terminal on the right and an editor on ah, the right. Yeah, super, terminal. great, great, I'm in business. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, for some reason, something strange has happened here on my computer. It's something that used to work before. Okay, so uh, actually before doing this, um, if you're running on a, I'm running on a Linux machine, uh, a laptop that has a processor that basically uh, is susceptible to these specter type of attacks um, and uh, in fact, just to see what the dramatic impact that this paper had, uh, Linux actually has now all kinds of mitigations and actually provides you with information about like which mitigation you have enabled, you know, what attacks your processor is vulnerable with. And in fact, if you uh, run this command in your uh, shell, you can just see, you know, the vulnerabilities that this CPU has. And as for example, here we see Spectre V1. It turns out this you know, CPU has that vulnerability. And we see that actually, you know, my computer color Linux kernel has a bunch of different mitigations uh, enabled. And so, uh, in you know, 2018, when we gave this lecture for the first time, there was none of that was there. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, and this has all happened in the sort of the last two years. Uh, another way to look at this is uh, you can, uh, the Linux kernel has all kinds of uh, places where it now disables uh, speculation uh, so to stop the attacks. And so for example, if you look for the graph through the Linux source code uh, for less, for no speculation, you see that uh, there's tons of places in the code where uh, there are calls to specific macros uh, and instructions to disable speculation for a little while, while the kernel is you know, uh, executing uh, a branch uh, or a sequence of code that actually uh, touches you know, sensitive information. So uh, the short story is that you know, this attack uh, has been, uh, is, uh, is, you know, has had quite a bit of, or this paper had uh, quite a bit of impact. Okay, so let's uh, look at the appendix and to get a little bit better handle of what the, <clears throat> how this attack works. So uh, here, uh, here's the victim code. So as I said, you know, the victim and the attacker are in the same basically program or in the same address space. And here's the victim code. Uh, and uh, we have an array one, exactly as in sort of the code I sketched out earlier. Uh, we have an array two. Uh, 
um, and that we're going to use to basically uh, leak uh, the uh, secret through. And here's actually the secret uh, sitting in the victim site. And here's the victim function, so the, the gadget that we're looking for. And you see that gadget has the same shape as the gadget that we just looked at. Uh, here, X is the offset. Array one size is you know, the size that we talked about. Array two is the array two that we're going to leak, you know, the secret through. And the way we do that is the same as in the uh, gadgets that we saw earlier. We basically use the uh, array. We, we, we're going to get the. We're going to use use X as the index into this array one. We're going to set up X in such a way, of course, that it actually will be uh, reading, you know, secret, and we use the first byte of the secret to index into array two, and then the attacker is going to measure, you know, the access to array two. Uh, hi, James, raise the hand. Yeah, please ask a question. A lot of factors of five twelve, which are everywhere, which one comment on it. Is that just to ensure that? Yeah. So the five twelve. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, the 512 is uh, to assure different cache lines. Uh, you'll see a couple more magic contents uh, showing up in a, in a little while. Uh, uh, but that's the main reason. But cache lines are 64 bytes. Why? Uh, ah, so there's also you need to defeat prefetching. Oh, OK. Uh, OK, so that's another reason. So I'm not 100% sure why exactly 512. Uh, my guess it's both, you know, to ensure different cache lines as well as defeating the prefetcher. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can play around if you want to, you know, you can download this code and play around with these numbers and you'll see that the attack uh, will not work in some cases if you change the numbers. Okay, so let me first look at the main function, uh, which is in the bottom of the file. And uh, the first thing actually to look at is this malicious X. So this is the X that we're going to pass into the gadget. And as you can see, the gadget, uh, the, the X is equal to the secret minus the array one. And so this will cause, correct, to uh, X to be, as we index with X into array one, we'll actually end up reading the first byte of the secret. And basically, you know, what the code then does is basically reading this malicious X uh, in a loop until it has read, you know, the full X, until it hits, I guess, uh, the, the, the end of the secret array. And so the interesting function is read memory byte, right? That is gonna basically use this uh, timing channel to read the secret. And so let's look at that. Uh, and we'll see there's a whole bunch of you know, complexity uh, in it. So first of all, uh, you know, it initializes a, things, a bunch of things to zero, not that important. And we'll see that actually it, ties, it takes a number of tries. Uh, so for every uh, byte of the secret that we're gonna read, uh, we're gonna try, try to do it a thousand times. And hopefully in one of these thousand times, you know, we'll get enough information that we know what the value is. So the first thing uh, that code does is it actually flushes array two from the cache. So this will ensure that array two is completely not in the cache. And this uses an x86 instruction uh, to do that. And then uh, it does 30 loops uh, to basically uh, mistrain or train the branch predictor to basically always take the if path uh, independent of the value of x. And you know, to make that happen, uh, uh, it basically manipulates X in strange ways, so that actually is very hard for the branch predictor to actually understand uh, the relationship between the branch and X. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, it will uh, mispredict. And we go through this loop uh, a bunch of different times, uh, and by, I think, the, let me, if I correct, uh, if, uh, so every six, uh, five of the six times, basically, we're going to pass in a, a correct value to the victim X, so a value that actually is within bounds. And only the sixth time, we're going to actually pass a malicious value, the, the, the negative offset, into the victim uh, function so that actually will read the, uh, uh, the secret array. Then the other thing that's going on here is that here's the array one is being flushed. Uh, and so uh, the array one size is being flushed. And so we're going to set it up basically that indeed we're going to pass in a big value or a negative value to the victim function. Array one is size is 
uh, is, is not in the cache. So if we go back to the gadget, which the gadget is here, uh, array one says, well, we're not in the cache. The processor will uh, speculate and start executing this code, even though it doesn't know what array one size is. And once in the six times, this X is this negative value uh, that will actually read you know, the first byte of the secret. And so this one is in the six time, array one X will read you know, the capital T and use that to index into array two and multiply this by times 512, you know, to basically account for cache lines uh, to make sure that basically those values differ in different cache lines and that uh, uh, prefetching uh, doesn't mess up the measurements. Nevertheless, the me let me finish. Nevertheless, this measurement is done multiple times. Uh, and the reason it's done multiple times, presumably, is because there's other things running on the computer. Uh, and that may uh, bring things into, for example, the cache. And so we could get a misread. And so you know, we're, we're, uh, in this particular uh, uh, code sequence, uh, we're doing it multiple times. Uh, so to get more confidence in, hopefully, uh, that we get the right value. Yeah, there was a question, go ahead. Yep, so the attacker has to know exactly how far uh, prior in memory the secret is being stored? Yep. Yeah, so the attacker needs to know quite a bit of, if you will, about the kernel address space layout uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I'll come back to that uh, in a little while. Uh, as you can see, th this is a quite a sophisticated attack, right? It requires detailed understanding of the processor, I require detailed understanding of the kernel layout for a user PSP program to uh, uh, pull this off. Um, uh, and certainly not trivial. And anyway, uh, once you know done this, once we've done this sort of uh, 30 times, uh, we're going to look at the the attacker is going to read array two. And uh, right here, correct? Here's the line that basically computes an address in array two. Uh, and basically times how long it takes to address, read that uh, element out of the array two. And as you can see, the way uh, the code actually goes through array two is actually it jumps around a bit. And again, this is to uh, avoid, you know, strike prediction, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, because otherwise maybe this one read will bring in a bunch of other values. And so if you go to the next element, you timing will be fast because they're already brought in. And this way you're jumping around and basically the hardware doesn't know which next element you can access. And so these timings are going to be more sensible. And then uh, if uh, the time to read that value, uh, that element of the array two is quick, then basically uh, the uh, code basically records that for that particular mix I, uh, the, the, the return value was, the, the read was very fast. And so presumably mix I is going to be one of the, is actually going to be capital T. And so it keeps doing that. Uh, if it doesn't get, if it gets a good result, uh, meaning that the top result, top hit is very high, much higher than the second best guess, it stops. And so basically uh, if we get lucky, you know, we do 30 iterations uh, of calling this victim function and then we break out. If we don't get a good result immediately, you know, we go back and do it another 30 times until we have tried it a thousand times. And so we can actually run this code if we want to. Uh, uh, so I compiled it uh, before and uh, basically, you know, what it's going to do is going to try to print out what his guesses are. So let's run this code and let me scroll back up. And, you know, for example, we'll look at the first one. We see malicious X is that in a particular offset. Uh, and uh, it has, it guesses that it is actually the value T. Uh, and we see next one is H, E. And in fact, if you read this word, the magic, you know, words are whatever. And so basically the, the program or this, this sequence of code you know, reconstructed everything uh, correctly. Uh, but it is quite sensitive. And, uh, uh, and you know, if you, run a lot of things at the same time on your computer, you know, actually will sometimes get these values not with low confidence or not at all. For example, if you recompile this program with optimization enabled, it actually doesn't work. And so it's just very sensitive to uh, 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 everything. Yes, there's a question, Nick, go ahead. So is part of that sensitivity 
um, um, coming from uh, the the thing getting evicted from cash because some other application got yeah. in. Yeah, for example, you know, it could be one source of uh, problems. And another question would be, how would we carry out a similar attack when the target, like the victim value is in a different address space? How do we calculate the ah. sex offset? Yeah, hold on to question for a second. Uh, right. I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a moment. Um, uh, any questions about this uh, Appendix A code? Uh, or is it sort of more or less clear how this works? So I'm going to switch back to my iPad. Okay, good. So let me stop sharing this. And Okay, everybody see that again? Is the iPad this one? Yep, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, so what we've seen right, just in this uh, pseudocode in this little demo is that we had one single address space where both the attack code and the victim code were in there, which is a bit of artificial, right? Because the attacker could have just read the secret directly instead of this complicated indirect way uh, of measuring it through uh, the cache. And so, uh, so it's not a real attack. And uh, as you know, you just ask, you know, how can you turn this into a real attack? And uh, there are different ways of doing it. And I'm gonna uh, describe one way. Uh, so the paper uh, describes a way uh, on Windows uh, by uh, looking in, uh, in the DDL that is linked with the dynamic link library that's linked with every application you know, for some, you know, the right gadget. Uh, there's another uh, attack which is not described in the paper, uh, but it was developed by the uh, Project Zero people, which, of which we read uh, other documents. And they basically discovered this uh, attack roughly at the same time as uh, the one, uh, as the authors of this particular paper. And their particular way, uh, what they call a proof of concept attack, uh, is quite elegant. And so uh, I'm going to describe that one. Uh, and again, uh, I should emphasize here, it's a proof of concept attack. So uh, it's more uh, real than uh, what's in Appendix A, uh, uh, but it's still uh, a proof of concept. You know, it's basically a demonstration that the attack can actually be fully uh, exploited or fully launched. Uh, and the way the Project Zero people set it up uh, is as follows. Uh, we have an application, we have, let me draw, the usual di the diagram. Basically, we have the kernel. Here we have basically a user program. Um, and the goal that they wanted to demonstrate is that they're using this timing attack. Uh, the user program can actually read a value, you know, a secret value out of the kernel address space. And the way they did this uh, is particularly uh, is sort of cool. Um, uh, as you remember uh, from maybe some of the previous lectures, we talked about Berkeley packet filters. Uh, and Berkeley packet filters is a little scripting language, a very low level scripting language that allows user applications to filter network packets. And uh, the basic idea is that, you know, the user program can download a Berkeley packet filter, a little program written in the Berkeley packet filter language, and you can think about it as a little assembly language, or portable assembly language, uh, into the kernel. Uh, and uh, basically, the uh, Project Zero people basically use two Berkeley packet filters to uh, pull off this attack. So the first, uh, b uh, and so there's a couple of things I need to explain. Um, the Berkeley packet filter actually has support for arrays. So uh, the Berkeley packet filter can refer to something like this array two. And that just sits in user space. Uh, and so the user program can just measure or access elements of the array two. The Berkeley packet filter gets loaded into the kernel and 
the kernel actually refers to this array too, maybe with you no know, kernel addresses. So we don't really know exactly where it is in the kernel, as you know, as somebody asked earlier. Um, and so to come to work around that program, the problem, the uh, Jupyter program actually installs a second Burkitt packet filter, basically to find address to basically to find array two in the kernel. Um, and uh, you know, there's a clever scheme that they use to basically, you know, scan the page tables to actually figure out where array two is located into the kernel address space. And that information basically goes into Berkeley, Berkeley, uh, PPF2, which is basically is our gadget. So remember, we have to have, uh, you know, a particular set of instructions that are of the right shape, correct? Like an if statement, then they use array one, and then they use then array two. Well, uh, in this particular case, the Berkeley packet filter is a bunch of assembly instructions. And so the project zero people can just write a Berkeley packet filter that exactly, you know, has the right gadget, and then download that gadget into the kernel. And now, of course, we need to arrange that this gadget actually gets executed. And, but Berkeley packet filters get executed when a packet arrives. And so basically, the project zero uh, proof of concept basically, you know, uh, sends packets to the kernels as a side effect, effect of sending these packets to the kernel, these Berkeley packet filters get run, and this particular gadget gets run, and it does exactly, you know, what we hope to do, namely, it will, uh, you know, will pass in an offset that, that basically reads, you know, the, uh, a secret byte, uses that secret byte to index into this array two, that array two happens to be in user space, and so the user space program can actually measure along, uh, Access to different elements of the array to uh, take exactly as we discussed in the appendix A or a little bit earlier in the outline. And so basically we have a clever use of Berkeley packet filters. Uh, they didn't even have to look for the gadget. They can just install the gadget in the kernel itself. Does this make sense uh, at a high level? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, and so what we see here is uh, sort of a proof of concept demonstration from end to end that indeed, you know, one can use these gadgets and this timing through the shared cache to deduce what the secret is that's inside of the kernel uh, memory. And this, correct, you know, if you're just going back to the beginning of the lecture, this is a serious issue, right, because now uh, what should have been impossible, namely for the user program to read kernel memory, you know, we're actually succeeding in doing. And so we're breaking isolation. Uh, and, and sort of a full demonstration that indeed uh, a user application is able to reuse, uh, read kernel memory. And, and the reason, uh, and this is an important point, right? Because the kernel can read any memory. So if you can read, if an application can read the kernel memory, in principle, the application can use that to actually read any application's memory uh, that's running on the machine, uh, because the kernel, in principle, has full access to all memory that actually sits on, on the computer. Now, this is not, still not a real attack, right? Because uh, it's a proof of concept attack. Uh, this requires, correct, that, you know, in, uh, you know, that the attacker, for example, can get, actually get an application to run uh, on this particular computer uh, that shares uh, you know, uh, on this particular kernel. And then, you know, that's sort of all left in the middle exactly how that would, would happen. Uh, but you can imagine, for example, in a cloud infrastructure where uh, an attacker uh, gets to run his programs on some particular uh, shared time shared machine, the, uh, this can be used to, ex in principle, exfiltrate uh, secrets from other user level programs and maybe from other customers you know, to the attacker. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, so uh, when this paper came out and when these uh, uh, proof of concept attacks uh, were demonstrated, uh, this caused quite a bit of consternation uh, because you know th th this looked like a serious uh, problem and it is a serious problem. Uh, although one should realize this is not an attack that is easy uh, to pull off, right? Uh, presumably, if you wanted to have a, 
Uh, one way to think about this, if you want to do a targeted attack because you wanted to steal somebody's information, maybe a phishing attack would be much easier to launch than sort of this complicated, uh, sensitive uh, and process specific uh, types of attacks. But nevertheless, it uh, breaks this fundamental assumption that isolation is strong. And, uh, and uh, so it's not a good thing. So what can you do? So what are the mediations? Um, so what happened, uh, so maybe the, the, let me first start just with the mediations. The, the, the most simple and straightforward to, to thing to do, or at least conceptual, uh, but hard to uh, execute in practice, is to modify the source code to not speculate or disable speculation. So basically, you know, what you want to do, if we sort of scroll back to our uh, code earlier, uh, what we like to arrange uh, is uh, what we can do, for example, is insert a statement here to not speculate. Um, and then uh, we'll, you know, we can, Intel or a lot of process of instructions that basically uh, the uh, source code writer can uh, insert and that basically tell the process don't do any speculation here. And, and so for any place where basically we might speculate with an offset that is bigger than size, uh, basically you would have to go through and basically insert instructions to form uh, don't speculate. And when we, a uh, little while ago when I, we did a git grab, you know, from the through the Linux source code. We saw a lot of these no speculate uh, uh, calls to the macro, and that's exactly what's happening. Uh, basically, the uh, those macros are there to basically disable speculation in uh, the in particular cases. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it actually is hard to find uh, and convince yourself that actually you covered all the cases. Uh, and, uh, and for example, in the Linux source code, there's many, many, many places. Uh, static analysis uh, is actually has a little bit of a trouble uh, finding all these places. Uh, sometimes, you know, the code is actually in, in, in assembly only and not in the C code. And so there's a lot of places. Uh, it's not easy to actually figure out where all the places are and where this code has to be uh, disabled, where the speculation is disabled. Um, Another thing that happened is that Intel uh, modified the microcode uh, of many processors uh, to uh, disable uh, certain t certain features, uh, so that it makes it harder to the attacks uh, to uh, perform. Um, the Linux uh, kernel changed the way they did kernel page the, the page tables. Uh, this makes it harder to. Uh, have a communication channel like, uh, between the kernel and user space. So for example, uh, you have to have some communication channel like this array two, uh, and uh, it used to be the case that was reasonably easy to arrange because basically when the kernel is mapped, it also mapped the user space memory. Um, but now that's not the case anymore. Uh, when you switch you know, into the kernel, the kernel gets its own page table and that does not include uh, the user uh, space part. Uh, so the, the VUM system basically got a pretty serious overhaul. A similar, uh, a major risk, correct, in all, the, uh, uh, a major security risk is actually uh, browsers. Uh, you know, one challenge, correct, as we talked about, is like how does the attacker get his code run on this machine uh, that you want to uh, exfiltrate and secret out? Well, one way would be, or a possible way, or one risk would be that actually the attacker can you know, write some JavaScript code, uh, basically get the victim to uh, fish uh, or visit his website and then run this JavaScript code and maybe leak information uh, out of other tabs in your browser or uh, maybe extra information out of the kernel. And, and so in fact, uh, all the browser vendors uh, went off and actually tried to uh, uh, mitigate that, those kind of attacks through JavaScript after somebody demonstrated that even out of JavaScript, you can be able to pull off this kind of measurement uh, on uh, caches to uh, leak uh, information. Uh, 
And for example, uh, the JavaScript bytecode interpreters are much more carefully in how they deal with indirect branches and uh, with these cases where uh, indices outside of arrays. Um, and so there's a large uh, number of uh, mitigations that uh, came into action, uh, in particular because it turns out there are many versions of this attack. Uh, there's not, you know, I just described one version, var uh, variant one, as it's called V1 of Spectre, uh, but there are other versions of uh, uh, Spectre that require slightly different mitigations. And, and in fact, you know, uh, and they were developed, you know, to stop this. Uh, but in the meantime, people also are finding yet other versions of uh, uh, other ways of basically other versions of variant one and variant two or other ways basically of uh, exploiting microarchitectural side channels in the processor to leak information. One way to think about this is that any sort of microarchitectural state that is shared uh, uh, across uh, a kernel or across applications like caches, but you know, there's much other microarchitectural state in principle can be a source, uh, can be used to actually you know, launch these kind of time, time channel, timing channels attacks. Any questions? This is all clear. Okay, let me say a few words, uh, outline uh, a second uh, attack that you know, was briefly mentioned in the paper too, uh, which is actually called, which is Spectre V2. And just to illustrate uh, that, you know, there's different ways, you know, of basically uh, playing this game. Um, and so, the code, the gadget that we're looking for is, you know, has a similar flavor as the first one, but slightly different in the body. Uh, so we're gonna, as usual, you know, size is gonna be, try to be evicted from the cache. We're gonna pick an offset that's bigger than size, um, or we're gonna try to, the attacker's gonna try to uh, pick an offset bigger than size, so, and then uh, use that to you know, find some value V you know, through, an array one, exactly as before. Uh, but instead of exploiting a V2 over an array two, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ex exploit the fact that the kernel actually does uh, indirect jumps. And what happens in this particular exploit is that um, the, the branch predictor, uh, it's gonna to try to execute, you know, it doesn't know size, so it's gonna try to execute code. Uh, yeah, and maybe it will, has, you know, has been trained to predict to go to the, in, you know, into this line of code, or this, this, this sequence of this block. And even when it actually gets into an indirect jump, it will guess what the value of the indirect jump is. And then we'll start executing code there. So if the attacker can sort of mistrain uh, the branch predictor uh, to basically uh, guess a function f of its choosing, of the attacker's choosing, then the attacker basically will find, can use a sort of gadget somewhere in the kernel and use that function then to leak information back, you know, to the, uh, the attacker. Um, and this is called, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the, the V2 uh, attack where basically, you know, uh, you poison the bench, branch predictor. And this attack is generally a little bit harder to pull off, and this is why I didn't describe it in any detail in the lecture so far. The, this attack is harder to exploit, uh, exploit because this requires deep understanding. Uh, the attacker has to have deep understanding exactly how the branch predictor works. Um, and you know, for, uh, uh, and the people have quite, people have quite they spent quite a bit of time uh, reverse engineering uh, actually how uh, branch prediction on Intel processors and AMD processors work, uh, and actually have been able to uh, launch this you know V2 attack to uh, to uh, leak uh, data from the kernel space, you know, to user space. 
but you know the mitigations uh, that I talked about, you know, the similar mitigations have been developed basically to um, make it hard for actually uh, uh, make it hard to pull this uh, attack off. One you know particularly interesting aspect of this uh, V2 attack is that uh, this actually the the sort of the predicting or guessing you know what actually the uh, indirect jump will go to is actually quite important for performance and what we're seeing here in uh, the spectre uh, and these timing channel attacks there's a very uh, delicate or trade-off between performance and security uh, you know one option for example is to uh, disable speculation for all indirect jumps in the kernel unfortunately uh, you know people have found that that's actually uh, cost quite a bit of performance and, uh, and so they're much actually more clever tricks than uh, disable speculation. You know, I, earlier I said, you know, there's instruction to uh, disable speculation. Uh, there are actually clever tricks, uh, clever mitigation tricks that are not as expensive as completely disabled speculation, uh, but still uh, give strong security. And if you're interested, uh, you should look at uh, red poline or octoline uh, for uh, the, the tricks that people play to uh, stop the attack, yet you know, get still uh, decent performance, although even then, you know, you're going to pay something in performance. And in some ways, that's where uh, the world currently is uh, with these uh, specter-like attacks. Uh, there's really a deep conflict or deep tension between, you know, high performance and uh, security of confidentiality in this case. And for example, many of the mitigations that you know, you'll find in the Linux kernel that can actually selectively be turned on and off uh, depending on like your risk profile. Uh, and for certain features, for example, uh, hyperthreading can be used to actually leak information in a similar way as these uh, specter attacks. Um, and, and typically in the Linux kernel, hyperthreading is uh, turned on uh, because if turning off would really you know, give a really big performance hit, uh, I think around 20, 30%. And so, uh, generally, when by default, you know, the Linux kernel or many kernels actually will keep uh, hyperthreading on, even though you know, there is some risk on it. Although people that, you know, for example, uh, maybe run trading applications on top of the Linux kernel will presumably disable hyperthreading to actually get, you know, really that uh, high level of uh, confidentiality. Uh, and this, and so this is sort of a question where, you know, there's this uh, deep tension between high performance and confidentiality. Uh, is a uh, topic of research and you know, people are trying to figure out, you know, is it possible to design high performance processors and, you know, get high confidentiality uh, and uh, uh, at the same time. And I think this is an open question of whether that can be done or not. And th the fundamental issue here really is like, how do you stop side channels? And uh, it just turns out to be very difficult. And, and the, the, the observation is that basically any shared state that the processor might have or can in principle be an, uh, a channel uh, for leak, leaking information. You know, in this case, you know, we talked about the shared state being uh, the caches, uh, but you know, other shared state that sits in microprocessors is, for example, the cache coherence protocol, uh, all, you know, branch predictor state, there's all kinds of state that are sort of lying around uh, that uh, in principle can be used to uh, uh, leak information. But having no shared state uh, makes it difficult for a process to be high performance or get high utilization. Uh, so uh, no shared state uh, would be one answer to stop uh, the speculation or these uh, leakage attacks. Uh, but you know that typically means you know, either low utilization or low performance. Another direction to go is to basically measure the side channel, identify the side channel, measure it, and try to make it low. Uh, and to a point that is low enough that you are willing to basically sort of take the risk. Uh, and those are you know to, to sort of the basic two approaches you know, to dealing. Uh, with actually really limiting or stopping side channels. So they're, they're basically a hard, hard problem.
Okay, so that brings me sort of to the end of the lecture. Um, and so the, basically the main topic of the lecture was Spectre, uh, yeah, which is a side channel uh, uh, attack, uh, exploiting basically shared caches, and timing you know, the values or access to the shared caches to actually uh, learn uh, confidential information. Uh, and so by that, I want to stop and uh, give an opportunity to the people to ask questions. Uh, if you want to hang around, uh, I'm willing to, I will hang around a little while too, uh, so they can answer more questions. Any questions? Could you explain again the mitigation strategies? Yeah, uh, yeah, you basically touched on them very lightly. Uh, so the basic idea, uh, I think, is to, at the high level, the basic idea is basically don't do speculation in uh, code that uh, uh, can access sensitive information. And so, for example, in these, you know, the, in the first type of attack that we were talking about where, um, let me scroll this this example up again. Uh, you know, we see what we want to do is basically in this branch when uh, uh, there's a risk that we uh, the process mispredicts the, the branch starts executing it with an offset that's really big this size. That's a risky uh, code path, and uh, in that risky code path, we should basically disable speculation by executing an instruction that tells the processor not to. Uh, speculate. And so the processor will just stop, will wait until size gets loaded from memory before it actually executes any uh, subsequent instructions. If that's the case, then we have no, uh, there's no risk uh, that information is leaked uh, through array two. Now in practice, people are much more, sophi more sophisticated uh, than I would just discuss because basically putting these uh, instructions in uh, can cost a lot of performance. And so there are clever tricks uh, for certain cases uh, that avoid some of the cost, uh, although still have some of the cost. And are those tricks that have to be inserted by the compiler or are they in CPU? Uh, the, 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 actually the compiler or the programmer has to insert them. So for oh. example, I showed you like uh, we did the git grep of the Linux source code and there was a whole bunch of sort of macros called no spec, no underscore spec. And that's exactly what they do. Got it. And, and the kernel developers are basically inserting them. And hopefully they get them in the all the right places. Thanks. Any more questions? Hey, uh, I have a question. I'm curious on just how exactly we define what is a side channel attack. Um, just mm -hmm. I know for something like, uh, I guess, like blind SQL injection, you know, you, you don't read the data um, exactly, but you can, you know, get a true or false or, um, you know, return a page or don't return a page or like delay for some time. Would mm -hmm. that be considered a side channel? Yeah, I think uh, almost anything, uh, the, the, the definition is pretty broad. Uh, uh, any way of reconstructing a secret without sort of directly reading it. Uh, but reconstructing it based on either timing or uh, learning about meta information or measuring these signals are considered timing, are considered side channel attacks. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll see you on Wednesday then. Bye. Bye.